Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Robin Minter Smyers, partner in charge of the Cleveland office of Thompson Hine and a proud member of the City Club's Board of Directors. It's my special honor to introduce the first speaker in our new series on family resilience, Marion Wright Edelman, president and founder of the Children's Defense Fund. 25 years ago, I had the honor of working for Marion and she has been for me and for countless others a role model and profound source of inspiration. Among the 35 industrialized nations on this planet, the United States has the second highest poverty, child poverty rate. A child in the United States has a one in five chance of being poor, and growing up poor has lifelong negative consequences. It decreases the likelihood of graduating from high school. It increases the likelihood of becoming a poor adult, of suffering from poor health, and of becoming involved in the criminal justice system. It almost seems self-evident, but it's worth saying that addressing poverty is a key component of creating and maintaining family resilience. It's worth saying, too, especially for our broadcast audience, that the purpose of this series on family resilience is to help the community better understand family resilience as the lens and tool for building policies and programs. In other words, if you help a family be strong, you're better able to help individuals with challenges. No one knows this better than Marion Wright Edelman, who was called to what she calls compassionate action at an early age. She founded the Children's Defense Fund in 1973 and its Leave No Child Behind mission to ensure every child a healthy start, a head start, a fair start, a safe start, and a moral start in life and successful passage to adulthood with the help of caring families and communities. A graduate of Spelman College and Yale Law School, Marion began her career in the mid-1960s when, as the first black woman admitted to the Mississippi Bar, she directed the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund office in Jackson, Mississippi. In 1968, she moved to Washington, D.C. as counsel for the Poor People's Campaign that Dr. King started before his death. Marion has received over 100 honorary degrees and too many awards to count, including the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the nation's highest civilian award, and the Robert F. Kennedy Lifetime Achievement for her writings. She has inspired legions of young people, including her own children, now three exceptional grown men and four grandchildren. On Monday, she will honor our region and recent graduates by delivering the commencement address at Oberlin College alongside First Lady Michelle Obama. Ladies and gentlemen, members and friends of the City Club, it is my deep honor and pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Marion Wright Edelman. I'm, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> they do grow up and they do good and they're smart, so I'm just so proud of Robin. Thank you and it's wonderful to be here with Stephen Dolly. We're old and dear friends. And I just want to introduce a 40-year colleague of mine from the Children's Defense Fund, Mary Lee Allen, where are you? She's been a pillar, and she is the family person and the child welfare person that you should follow up with on this meeting. And I wanted you to meet our new um, head of the CDF Ohio, um, Renuka Madeyev. Madeyev. She's wonderful. So she's in Columbus. Bother her as much as you can. And I'm just so pleased to be here and feel the vibrancy of this new leadership. It's fantastic. And I love the sharing at the beginning because children don't come in pieces. And one of the big things that we've all got to do is to realize that and that good policy should be like good parenting and good community servicing should be like good families. But I mean, we just get out of silos and address the needs of the whole child. I don't know any parent who would say, I'm going to keep my child safe but not have them um, get health care or not have them fed or not be, you know, whatever. I mean, let's just use common sense in taking care of our children. So I'm just so grateful to see all of you coming together across your disciplines and across all of your good works to address the needs of the whole child. Always keep the child in the middle of the table, not your own issue interest. And so we'll, we'll make great progress if we proceed there. We have um, issued a new report on ending child poverty now. 
And I want to say now, because children have only one childhood, and it's now. And so we should have a sense of urgency and persistence, and we've been like a, a broken record, but I think it's an absolute national moral disgrace that there are 14.7 million poor children in this country, and six and a half million of them are extremely poor in the world's largest economy. It is also unnecessary, it's costly, and I believe it is the greatest threat to our national economic and military security. The 14.7 million poor children in our nation exceeds the populations of Ohio and Iowa, or the combined populations of Sweden and Costa Rica. Our nearly six and a half million extremely poor children living at below half that poverty level exceeds the combined populations of Connecticut and Mississippi or is greater than the population of Finland. Shamefully, the younger children are the poorer they are during their years of greatest brain development. I don't know why we don't do what we know works and is going to save children and be the most costly investment. And every other American child is non-white, and one in two of our black babies is poor after a transforming civil rights movement 150 years after slavery was legally abolished. More than half of our children here in Cleveland lived in poverty in 2003, 54%. We can do better. More than one in four children, or 28% in Cleveland, lived in extreme poverty. 67% of your Cleveland children lived in areas of concentrated poverty. Census tracts with poverty rates of 30% or more between 2009 and 2013. 61 percent of children lived in households receiving supplemental security income, cash public assistance, or food stamps, which they're trying to cut in Washington again between 2009 and 2013. And 20, 58 percent of your children lived in families where no parent had regular full-time employment in 2013. Benjamin Franklin said a long time ago that the best family policy was a job and we need to focus on jobs, jobs and the dignity of work and the ability to, to, to support a family. In Cuyahoga County, 24% of children were food insecure in 2013, and 17% of your 16 to 19 year olds in 2013 were disconnected youths, neither employed nor enrolled in school. America's and Cleveland's poor children did not ask to be born, as has already been pointed out did not choose their parents, country, state, city, neighborhoods, race, color, or faith. In fact, if they had been born in 35 other rich industrialized nations, um, they would be less likely to be poor. Among those 35 countries, America ranks 34th, as Robin pointed out, in relative child poverty, ahead only of Romania, whose economy is 99% smaller than ours. The United Kingdom, whose economy, if it were an American state, would rank just above Mississippi, committed to and succeeded in cutting its child poverty rate by half in 10 years. We can't wait 10 years. That's another generation of children. It is about values. It is about political will. It's about us making a big ruckus and a lot of noise and not going away until they do what we have to do to save our children, which is going to be about saving our country. And I hope that we will... Um, begin to counter the fact that sadly our politics too often trumps good policy and moral decency and responsibility for the next generation and for the nation's future. It is way past time for a critical mass of Americans to confront the hypocrisy of America's pretension to be a fair playing field while almost 15 million children languish in poverty. A few months back, or the last of last year, we asked the Urban Institute, a nonpartisan institute, to look at nine policies and programs that we know work and make an, a positive impact on children, and to tell us um, how much poverty alleviation impact we could have for children if we invested fully in those nine programs and asked them to tell us how much it would cost. And we issued this report. I hope you'll go to the website. But we also have print copies that you can get available with very moving pitches here, but it's called Ending Child Poverty Now. And here's what we found. We found first that the, the solutions to, to, to doing away with child poverty already exist. We don't need to reinvent a whole lot of wheels. We need to invest in what we already know works. 
and that by doing these things, the Urban Institute told us if we invested in nine programs, creating subsidized jobs, most of them relate to jobs and making jobs pay and subsidizing jobs, um, increasing their income tax credit, the child tax credit, dependent tax credit, making them fully refundable. Um, all the things that we need, we know. I mean, there's just nothing new in any of this. It's just we need to do it. Making housing vouchers available to all households um, below 150% of poverty for whom fair market rent exceeds 50% of their income. That was the single largest poverty alleviation impact. It would lift 2.3 million children out of poverty if you dealt with that basic housing issue. And we know children go hungry. There are millions of families with no income um, in America, and they have children in their families. Um, and we need to talk about how we keep and expand SNAP benefits. I still call them food stamps. Um, and we can also do things on passing child support through to families um, and not to states. But these are pretty basic things, and they laid out. They're laid out in the report. And the grand cost total of this would be $77.2 billion. And for this $77.2 billion invested in these nine programs, um, we could reduce overall child poverty by 60%, black child poverty 72%, and lift the floor for 97% of all of our poor children. Just make life a little bit better, a little less hungry, a little less scary, a little less homeless. Child poverty is far too expensive to continue because every year we keep 14.7 million children in poverty, cost our nation a half trillion dollars or $500 billion, six times more than the $77 billion investment we propose to do what we want to do to get child poverty lower by 60%. We've been saying this for a very long time. We issued our first report on wasting American future and that was guided by um, Bob Solo, Robert Solo at MIT, um, our recent 2014 Presidential Medal of Freedom recipient and Nobel laureate economist, who in Wasting America's Future very presciently wrote, for many years Americans have allowed child poverty levels to remain astonishingly high far higher than they would think a rich and ethical society would tolerate. The justification when one is offered one at all has often been that action is expensive. We have more will than wallet. I suspect, however, Bob Solo said, that in fact our wallets exceed our will. But in any event, this concern for the drain on our resources completely misses the other side of the equation. Inaction has its cost too. As an economist, I believe that good things are worth paying for, and that even if curing children's poverty were expensive, it would be hard to think of a better use in the world for money. If society cares about children, it should be willing to spend money on them. I completely agree. And we know that investment in many of the safety net programs for families with children have paid off already long term and helped foster resilience. A 2012 study documented that children with access to food stamps in the 60s and 70s grew up healthier and more likely to finish high school. Research shows that supplementing families' incomes through refundable tax credits and other means improves children's educational and employment outcomes. A new 2015 study reports that children with access to Medicaid grew up to earn higher wages and pay more in taxes by age 28. An update on what some of you may know as the Moving to Opportunity study also had good news. Children and families who got rented vouchers to move in less poor neighborhoods in the 1990s were doing better as adults than those who stayed in poor neighborhoods. And of course, we know a lot about the research now on the long-term effects of high-quality preschool programs and other early childhood interventions like home visiting programs that use school nurses. These two improve a range of adult outcomes. And because we've laid out these nine policies, we are still absolutely adamant about putting into place a high quality early childhood system for every child in this country to get ready for school. We know that that's gonna pay off in high school graduation rates. And why is it that we keep wanting to hurt children and cost money that's gonna make them dependent on us? What is the matter with us? Not only does child poverty cost far more than eliminating it would, we have so many better choices that reflect better values and more just values, as well as economic savings. And we believe that food, shelter, quality early childhood to get every child ready, and an equitable 
high quality education for all children should take precedence over massive government subsidies or welfare for the rich and blatantly excessive spending for military weapons sometimes that don't work. And we lay out some of these and we lay out the ways in which we could pay for them. We don't have a, we, we, we have a fundamental values problem in this nation and we need to confront that. And so we lay out all the ways that we, some of the ways that we can pay for these through tax loopholes, which include eliminating tax breaks for the wealthy by taxing capital gains and dividends at the same rates as wages, which would save more than $884 billion a year. We could do what we want to do just for that one tax um, um, help to people who don't need it. And we lay out some of the military things. And we have been living in a Washington that recently, talking about budget balancing and all of that, but where our House and Senate budgets um, just voted to repeal the estate tax for the 5,400 wealthiest Americans, the top two-tenths of 1% without a pay-go, at a taxpayer drain of $269 billion. Well, that would lift all of our 14.7 million children from poverty for three and a half years. We don't have a money problem. We have a, a, a morality problem and a value problem. We need to make a lot of noise and stop it. And they also voted to give the Pentagon about $38 billion it didn't ask for, again, without a pay-go. Um, um, to, um, in an off-budget fund, um, the Pentagon didn't want it, didn't ask for it, and yet, you know, that $38 billion would be about halfway to what we need to lift a whole lot of children out of poverty. We need to begin to make more noise, child advocates, because this is about voice. This is about the need for a new transforming movement, and we have to mount it. If we love America and our children, we must all stand together against any excessive greed that tramples millions of our children's lives entrusted to our care. Our Declaration of Independence says we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men and women are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. After more than two centuries, it's time to make these truths evident in the lives of all, not just some children, and to close our, and to close our intolerable national hypocrisy gap and show the world whether democratic capitalism is an oxymoron or can work. But I do know that a nation that does not stand for its children does not stand for anything and will not stand tall in the 21st century world or before God. We need to regain our moral bearings and common sense as a nation. Those who educate and care for our children are devalued in our society if we measure worth by the nation's highest parent value, which is money. Our society says that teachers are nearly 270 times less valuable than one corporate CEO of one of the top 300 firms with an average income of 15.2 million compared to an elementary school teacher's average salary of $56,300. A high school teacher, however skilled and hardworking, earned less than a year, a little over $58,000, and the nearly 164,000 one basketball player earned in one day. I don't think that was from Cleveland. <laughs> And all of our kindergarten teachers, I bet he made more, um, and all of our kindergarten teachers combined earn less in one year than 25 hedge fund managers. Lee Iacocca, former chair and CEO of Chrysler, said in a completely na rational society, the best of us would be teachers and the rest of us would have to settle for something less. We need to reorder our national values and our national priorities. <laughs> the day before Dr. King was assassinated, he called his mother to give her his next Sunday sermon title. It was Why America May Go to Hell. And he warned that America is going to hell if we don't use her vast resources to end poverty and to make it possible for all of God's children to have the basic necessities of life. And during his last year of life, as he was really preparing and going around the country calling for a poor people's campaign and for an end to poverty for all Americans who were poor, and in his last Sunday sermon, he repeated this, and he, he constantly told the parable of Dives, and the rich man Dives, and the poor man Lazarus who was sick, and who came every day seeking crumbs from Dives' table. Dr. King said Davies went to hell not because he was rich, 
but because he did not realize that his wealth was his opportunity to bridge the gulf, separating him from his brother and allowed Lazarus to become invisible. He warned this could happen to rich America if we don't use her vast resources to end poverty and to make it possible for all of God's children to have the basic necessities of life. I hope you, we will, all these years later, heed his urgent warnings and build the transforming movement to finish what the civil rights movement began. And so I just want to end with, I, we are pack racks in my family, we pet rats, and we always share old clippings. And one showed up one day, I don't know where it's from, um, by an anonymous age called Everything You Need to Know in Life You Can Learn from Noah's Ark. So I've been telling the lessons a lot recently. Um, don't know who he was, but I thank him. Um, but the first lesson was don't miss the boat. And the United <laughs> States is going to miss the boat to the future if to lead and compete in our globalizing world because we're not preparing a majority of our children for the future. A majority of all of our children in all races, 70% of Latino and 80% of black children cannot read a computer at grade level in fourth and eighth grades and dropout rates, as you know, are rampant aided by zero tolerance school discipline policies that we have got to correct. 75% of our 17 to 34 year olds seeking to serve in the military were rejected because of literacy, health, and prior incarceration problems. I constantly say, I'm so sick of hearing myself say that the greatest national, economic, and military security threat does not come from any outside enemy. It comes from these figures, our gross neglect of our children, and it's going to be our undoing. Second lesson is we're all in the same boat. Many Americans may not like or think that they have any self-interest in assuring a fair playing field for other people's children, especially poor and non-white children who will constitute a majority of our child population, school population, by 2019. Isn't it better to prepare them to be a productive workforce than for us to support them in costly prisons where one in three black and one in six Latino boys born in 2001 end up increasing neither our safety nor our productivity? Many states are spending on average two times more per prison than for public school pupil. I can't think of a dumber investment policy. And I just hope that we will begin to reorder our priorities. God did not make two classes of children, and we continue to do so at our peril. The third lesson is plan ahead, because it wasn't raining when Noah built the ark. And I'm sure everybody thought he was absolutely crazy, but tomorrow is today, and children have only one childhood, and providing all of them, as many of you in this room are trying to do, and I am just thank you from the bottom of my heart, a healthy start. I good set of early childhood experiences, a roof over their heads, a stable, first-rate schools with first-rate caring teachers who have high expectations for every child. And I'm trying to keep everybody out of law school, Robin, um, and trying to send them all into education. Um, and um, even if they do get paid better, they're doing the Lord's work and they're doing the nation's work. And I hope that we can have stimulating, early, high quality, but full day programs in the summer and after school programs for children because we know when children go out in the summer they lose three to about three months of, 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 of achievement for poor children. All of us middle class parents make sure that our kids get all these enrichment things during the summer. Poor kids don't get that and they keep losing grounds. And I don't know why we can't have an honest discussion about public sector jobs. Imagine how many jobs we would create if we had a universal high quality early childhood system or a high quality after school system and summer learning system to keep children off of the streets. I mean, Let's get a public sector. Let's just get jobs on the agenda and let's invest in helping our children and creating jobs. And we just have to begin to reorder our community business in our very quick fix, quarterly profit driven culture if we're going to save our future. The fourth lesson is stop being timid. Don't listen to critics and naysayers. Um, if you don't want to be criticized, don't say, do, or be anything. But you will not build strong children and a strong country through silence. It's not always the people who are noisy on the other side. It's all of us who are silent on our side. Get up 
and let's begin to speak up for children when they are being mistreated or when our representatives um, are, are voting in the wrong way. Hold your Congress people and senators accountable. Hold your state legislators and governors accountable. Children can't vote, but you can. So be a voice in a thoughtful way and speak up to protect our voteless and voices young. Lesson five is for safety's sake, travel in pairs or better still in community groups and coalitions, which is why I think this is wonderful. <laughs> work together, work together. It's not about you, it's about children. Get ourselves out of the way, organizations and, and all of our little particular egos that we've gotta be out there. Um, work together with urgency and persistence. Lone Ranger and top-down leadership will not work. We must together reweave the fabric of family and community and utilize the power of our individual and collective voices and votes and get things done and put children on the agenda. We don't need sprinters. We don't need dabblers or just press conference people. Um, we don't need those or headline seekers. We need marathon servant leaders. The German playwright Bertolt Brecht a long time ago said that there are those who struggle for a day and they are good. There are those who struggle for a year, and they are better. But then there are those who struggle for much of their lives, and they are the indispensable ones. And I hope everybody in this room who loves children, who loves our nation, will be indispensable ones, because that's what the nation needs if we persist and get things done. And while you hear a whole lot of things about what we don't have and the things that don't work, you should be really proud of what has been accomplished over the last 50 years and 40 years because of the voices of people like you. Millions of children have gotten health care. Millions of children have gotten child care. Millions of children have gotten a better education and have gotten a place to live, and we've made real strides, but we need to finish the job. No child is dispensable, and this nation needs to recognize that. I want to just end. <laughs> with a wonderful story here from Cleveland. Um, we celebrated five Ohio children who beat the odds in Columbus um, a few weeks back. And these are remarkable children. I, just, I believe so strongly that you don't have a right to give up on any child. And with the help of a caring grandma or an aunt or uncle or a teacher or a counselor, and over the last 22 years, we've celebrated about over 800 children who, despite homelessness and gun violence and parent abandonment, have all kind of managed um, to, to, to stay on their feet and not only and to give back. I was in Houston yesterday celebrating five children, you know, sexual abuse, um, homelessness. I mean, they live unthinkable lives, but one person reaching out, whether it's a family member or somebody in that community, um, can make a difference and turn their lives around. And one of the people I want to tell you about, and we're going to put them up on your, I hope you're going to be able to see all five of them um, at some point soon. There's a young woman from Cleveland, whose name is Brittany, and she's going to be somebody. Um, and she was one of our recent inspiring ones that I um, celebrated last month. And here's what she said, her story. My mother was doing drugs, specifically cocaine, crack cocaine. I almost died. Said that I, they said I was not either going to be deaf or retarded or I wasn't going to survive past childhood or infancy because there were so many chemicals in my system. The odds were stacked against Brittany Lee before she was born. Her mother was addicted to drugs, like Brittany's grandfather and many others in their poverty-stricken Cleveland neighborhood. Brittany's mother used drugs throughout her pregnancy and went to prison for a year just after Brittany's work, birth. As a poor black crack baby with an addicted, incarcerated mother and an absent father, Brittany started life in danger. Being born into an unstable poor family or to a single teen incarcerated or absent parent are all known risk factors in America's cradle to prison pipeline, which we have got to break up. It's becoming the feeder system for the new American apartheid of mass incarceration. <laughs> Grab these babies and let's break up this pipeline. The disadvantages that millions of poor children and children of color face from birth along the continuum um, to and through adulthood call for prenatal care, a health care system, and they're often denied little or no um, early childhood education enrichment. But that's where Brittany um, grandmother stepped in. Um, after her mother, who still had been in dress living in a drug infested neighborhood, had stayed addicted to drugs and was not in Brittany's life, but Brittany was lucky because she had a grandma who stepped in 
She'd already had custody of Britain, Brit Brittany's older brother and sister. She brought Brittany home too. And Brittany says, my grandmother stepped up to the plate to raise us because we didn't want us to, she didn't want us to go into the foster care system. Brittany's grandmother didn't have a lot of money, but she was a stable source of love and support throughout childhood. And Brittany flourished in her care. Despite doctors' concerns when she was born as a drug-addicted child, Brittany was resilient and became a straight-A student who loved school from the beginning. Her grandmother was her rock, even while struggling with, an auto, with, with lupus, which got worse as Brittany got older. When Brittany was eight years old, her grandmother suffered a seizure when they were home alone together, and Brittany had to call 911 and ride in the ambulance with her grandma to the hospital. From then on, she was terrified of losing her grandmother. Brittany's mother, Felicia, who had come in and out of her life throughout her childhood, was struggling towards sobriety. Nine months after Felicia became sober, Brittany's mother, when Brittany was 10, her grandmother died. Felicia remembers the moving moment, she said, when my mother held my hand and she told me, Alicia, I want to go home. And I thought she meant go home, like put her in a car and take her home. But no, she was saying she was tired and she was ready to go home to glory. She looked at me in the eyes and she said, and God told me that you were ready, that you were ready to be a mom, that you're going to be a good mom, that you're not going to use drugs anymore, and that I could go. Brittany's mother was finally ready to step in, <coughs> regain custody, and learn how to be the parent her daughter needed and deserved. Today, Brittany is a high school senior about to graduate from Cleveland's John Hay School of Science and Medicine, and dreams of becoming a cardiac surgeon. She recently received our Beat the Odds scholarship and says of her beloved grandmother, she's looking down on me, I'm sure she's so proud. And right now I just wanna make her even more proud. I wanna show her that she didn't fight for me for nothing. These children are worth fighting for. And Brittany's grandmother was one of the many caregivers raising children in kinship care or grand families, headed by grandparents or other relatives who step in when parents are unable to do so. Sometimes a child is removed from parents' care by the state and placed with relatives in foster care. In other cases, children like Brittany are placed informally with relatives outside foster care. More than six million children are being raised in households headed by grandparents and other relatives, and of those, two and a half million are living in households without their parents present. These relative caregivers are living, are like Britain's grandmother, are willing to care for the children, but often need financial or other help to appropriately meet their children's needs. A number of states have used subsidized guardianship programs to support kinship families and grandfather, grandfamilies. Kinship care has been found to help children maintain family and continuity and community connections. There is strong evidence that children placed in kinship care experience greater stability, have fewer behavioral problems, and are just as safe, if not safer, than children in non-relative care. In Brittany's case, all of these positive outcomes came to pass. And after her grandma stepped up to the plate a child who could easily have become a statistic is beating the odds and is going to be a star here in Ohio and in our nation with a bright future. These facts are not acts of God. These are acts of caring people. You're God's hands and feet in, in the world, and you're the ones who can make more of these Britannies have hope and a future. And that's what they're called, we're called upon to do. These are our choices as human beings, and as leaders, I have, when we left home, my mother took in 12 foster children. And I still have guilt feelings when I would wake up some morning and there's another child in the other bed in my bedroom, but they're all thriving and it, they just need one caring human being, but they need all the caring ones to get together into a mighty chorus. Um, that demands fair treatment for all. And so it is time for us to build 
a new transforming movement to end child poverty for every child in America. God did not make two classes of children, so we got to save them all. And we must make sure that no child is left behind. So I'm going to end with a prayer from my friend Anna Hughes. I, I, I tend to use three or four or five prayers all the time. I don't know what I said the last two times I was here or whether I even <laughs> knew this one. Um, but I love her. She's a, she's a woman down in Tennessee. And she, again, talks about the importance of praying for children who sneak popsicles before supper and erase holes in math workbooks and can never find their shoes. But we also must pray and stand up for children who stare at photographers behind barbed wire, who can't bound down the street in a new pair of sneakers, who never counted potatoes and have been born in places we wouldn't be caught dead, who never go to the circus and live in an X-rated world. But let's also stand and pray for children who bring us sticky kisses and fistfuls of dandelions who hug us in a hurry and forget their lunch money. But let's also pray and accept responsibility for children who never get dessert, who have no safe blanket to, dry, to drag behind them, who watch their parents watch them die, who can't find any bread to steal, who don't have any rooms to clean up, whose pictures aren't on anybody's dresser, and whose monsters are real. Let's pray and stand up and build a movement for children who spend all their allowance before Tuesday, throw tantrums in the grocery store and pick at their food, who like ghost stories, shove dirty clothes under the bed and never rinse out the tub, who get visits from the tooth fairy and don't like to be kissed in front of the carpool, who squirm in church or temple and scream in the phone, whose tears we sometimes laugh at, and whose smiles can make us cry. But let's also pray and accept responsibility for and stand up for all of those children in our rich nation whose nightmares come in the daytime, who'll eat anything, who've never seen a dentist, who aren't spoiled by anybody, who go to bed hungry and cry themselves to sleep, who live and move but have no real being. Let's pray and vote and stand up and fight for those children who want to be carried, but also for those children who must be carried, for those we never give up on and for those we don't, who don't get a second chance. Let's fight for children whom we smother and for those who will grab the hand of anyone kind enough to offer it. I'm sure all of you in this room and your presence here today says that you have been offering these hands. We've got to bind these hands very much stronger together. We've got to organize and become strategic. We've got to build that next movement to save our nation's soul and to save our children's future. And I can't think of anything that's a better burden to bear. I thank you for what you're doing. Keep doing it. Today, we're enjoying a Friday Forum featuring Marion Wright Edelman, President and Founder of the Children's Defense Fund. We encourage you to organize questions for our speaker now and remind you that your questions should be brief and to the point. We welcome all of you here and those joining us via our primary media partner, 90.3 WCPN, WVIZ PBS, 104.9 WCLV, WCLV Idea Stream or one of our many radio stations across the region and the country that carry the City Club programs. Television broadcasts of the City Club are made possible by Cleveland State University and PNC. Our live webcast is supported by the University of Akron. Be sure to join us Friday, August 14th for the second program in our Family Resilience Series featuring Judy Langford, Senior Fellow and Associate Director of the Center for the Study of Social Policy. For more information about our upcoming and past forums, please visit us online at cityclub.org. Today's forum is the Stephen A. Minter Endowed Forum. This forum, honoring my father, Stephen Minter, was made possible by the member banks of the Cleveland Foundation in honor of my father's retirement from the foundation in July of 2003. We deeply appreciate the generous support of Chase, First Merit, 
Huntington Bank, Key Bank, and PNC. My parents, Steve and Dolly Minter, are with us today. Will you please stand and be recognized? Today's forum is also the first in our Family Resilience Series, sponsored by St. Luke's Foundation and the William J. and Dorothy K. O'Neill Foundation, in partnership with Goodwill Industries of Greater Cleveland and East Central Ohio. The purpose of this series is to help the community better understand family resilience as a lens and tool for building policies and programs. We thank our sponsors for their support. Our community partners for today's program are City Music Cleveland and the Legal Aid Society of Cleveland. We thank you for your support. Additionally, we welcome guests at tables hosted by the Cleveland Metropolitan School District, Cleveland Neighborhood Progress, Cuyahoga Community College, Thompson Hine, and the Center for Community Solutions. We thank you all for your support. We also welcome students today from Hawkins School and Shaw High School. Students, participation in the City Club's programs is provided by the Laub Foundation. Will the students please stand and be recognized? <laughs> now it's time to return to Marion Wright Edelman for our traditional City Club question and answer period. We welcome questions from everyone, including guests. Holding the microphones today are Content Associate Teddy Eisenberg and Director of Programming Stephanie Jansky. Please, first question, please. Uh, good afternoon. I just want to thank you for being here. Uh, I'm looking for over you. Here. I hear you. All right. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> I want to thank you for being here, Ms. Edelman. Um, in a piece that you wrote on criminalizing poverty, uh, you began it by saying that a 13-year-old felt like he was being held captive. And there's something else that's holding our young people captive, that's causing young children to hate school, to not want to go to school, it's causing them to get sick, to cry, uh, to vomit, my, my colleagues have told me in the, in the education profession, and that's the standardized testing. There is an obsession with standardized tests, it victimizes children who are not successful, it victimizes teachers who are doing the best we can, um, and it blames children for the conditions of poverty from which they come and which creates so much stress already. So can you give your thoughts on uh, the standardized testing and what it's doing well, to our children? They're testing their tests. You've got to have accountability measures. Um, and I have a very robust debate around my dinner table from two of my children who are in education. One is on one side and one's on the other. <laughs> but we do have to have accountability. Um, and whether or not we are trying to figure out how we use tests in order to diagnose what children need um, and what they're missing is another thing. Um, but um, I think that we've got to find ways that, that the, the real issue is whether that's the test that is used not just for children but whether the whole teacher's accountability the issue is really about teacher accountability um, and not just about children. But we've got to find ways of holding um, our, our children not learning. You cannot have over 70%, a majority of all of your children, and 70% and plus of your Latino children and 80% of your black children not able to read and compute at grade level. You gotta find out why, and you have to be able to figure out what is happening here and what they're not getting. I happen to think that teaching is the most important profession or one of the most important professions that there is. And I'm trying to keep, I got all my, I, it really, really is. And early childhood people and working, the point of my speech was that people who work with children you know, are, are the people who are doing the Lord's work and are going to have an awful impact. I try to encourage everybody to go into teaching, but I'll tell you, we've got to hold every teacher accountable, just as we've got to hold every parent accountable. And if you don't love children, if you don't have high expectations for every child, please get out of the classroom. And so we really have got to make sure that children are learning. I think we need to be open on how do we hold accountable I'll make sure that children are learning and we should be debating that and we're debating it rather robustly within CDF and within my family kitchen table. Um, but we need children got to learn. You cannot have the dropout race we've got. You cannot have the children um, being left behind. You cannot have children not reading or computing. So we've got to sit down together and get adult interest out of the way and then figure out what is going to work to make sure that our children are getting what they need in order. And let me just say one more thing since you've opened up the school thing, is that these zero tolerance discipline policies 
Um, I've never understood it. We, we did our first report was on children out of school in America, and we knocked on thousands of doors, and we looked at all the census data, and we found that one of the big contributing causes of children dropping out of school and never coming back were school discipline policies. And all three-fourths of those policies back then, and too often still are, are for nonviolent offenses, for truancy and tardiness. Now, why does it make sense to put a child out of school for not coming to school? You find <laughs> out why he's not coming to school. Children have got to have an education, so we really just need to come to our senses and not try to fit children in the convenience of adults, but really provide the kind of atmosphere and expectations and supports that they need in order to realize their fullest potential. So let's keep the child in the middle of the table and figure out how we can have sensible policies that support that child's success and not rely overall too much on punishment. We're still one of the only industrialized countries that allows corporal punishments in schools, in, in, in schools and, and in prisons. I mean, we need to, again, it's, 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 schools are about children. And so we've got to figure out how do we get the best people in those schools, reward them as much as we can, train them as best as we can, and stop all the fights over the little things. I mean, we've been having a big fight over, as you know, the Title I program, the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. I don't call it that other name, which is our trademark breach. Um, but, and everybody's been fighting, testing has been the, one of the big issues that everybody's been talking about. I said, we're sitting here fighting over testing when they're about to gut the entire accountability for how much money is going to go to poor children and be concentrated on poor children. Get out of our silos and let's see how we're going to make sure that the resources that are needed to make sure that poor children have what they need and that states don't just use this as another general slush fund or supplanting fund. And so we keep getting on the wrong issues. Keep children in the middle of it all. And let's all adults stretch to see how we can meet those needs, teachers and counselors and parents and, and administrators, but the, it's about children. And so often they do get lost. So I'm, you know, I think that we're going to have a thoughtful conversation about assessment. We do have to have some kinds of assessments and ways of knowing, but it should be multiple assessments. The children don't come in pieces again. And so you've got to look at the whole child. Good afternoon. Um, thank you. I wanted to first and foremost thank City Club and their partnership with Shaw High School. I was a Shaw High School senior when you came in 2007, and so because of that, I've been participating with Freedom Schools program for the past Yay. eight years. Yay! So my um, my question my question for you is: um, We currently work with Freedom Schools with the Department of Youth Services out at Indian River Maximum Security Juvenile Facility. How do we, as advocates, implementing programs that we know work, that we've seen transform males that are in opposite gangs that read Mandela's way together and interact together and we've never had any complications. How do we bring light to programs like that um, to continue to make that ruckus or make that noise? Well, I think that the parent, this is more complicated in juvenile detention facilities, but the parent engagement provisions for parents coming every week. And they really, most of them, they really come. Um, and we need to help them learn how they can help their children. The whole Freedom Schools is a summer um, enrichment program that's based on wonderful books that are picked around the theme, I Can Make a Difference, um, in myself, my school, my community, my nation, my world. And they, as one little girl says, they, they have characters that look like us, and they give us hope. And we've got to confront the lack of diversity in children and youth literature in this country. But children need to see themselves. And these young people, these children, K through 12, are taught by college students who come from their communities and who look like them. It's hard to be, but you can't see. And so it's really important, these young role models. And I've been very pleased that a third, um, almost every summer, a third and sometimes a half, of the young college mentors are from our black males and Latina males. Um, and, and many of them are changing their majors and they're going into education and not going to law school. I'm really pleased <laughs> about that. Um, I'm particularly, they work everywhere because they are child centric. And we have 14 in secure detention facilities and some of them here in Ohio and I'm very pleased with that. And I remember the first two, I'll give you just two little vignettes. Um, the first one was in, um, we had one in Maya Angelou in Washington, but the, the Catholic Diocese of the Catholic Charities, I can't remember which in Houston opened up one, oh, six, six or seven, eight years ago. And they were very worried because this was a very, um, you know, high security facility um, in Houston um, and um, didn't know how that was gonna, gonna, gonna hunt. 
And, um, but the children got very engaged in the books, and, and the college students have lots of energy. I, I tell you, after the first half hour of Harambe, when you get all your stuff out, you wouldn't have a whole lot of discipline problems in your schools. But a little boy whose sentence had ended left, had to go. And he came back the next Monday and said, I'm not leaving until that fun school is over. <laughs> he wanted to come back to jail in order to experience that. Um, in Los Angeles, where we have now five in very secure detentions, the guards were very skeptical about it. And they told us we had to use their teachers. We said, fine, but they have to come to Haley Farm for training. And you have to use our college students. And the probation guards come. And when they got down there and they saw all of that energy from 2,000 young people, and they got into it. Um, and they were so worried that the black Latina gang rivals were going to tear up the place. Well, it turns out that, you know, after the first few days of Harambe, and they learned these chants, but then I, I've been to Freedom Schools on the second day, and they know every chant. I said, you sure this school started yesterday? And the kids will learn what they're excited about. Um, but they, um, the, the suspensions went down over 80%. Fights went down 90%. They were, they, 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 they were having fun. And you've, the guards began to forget they were guards. And they all began to get engaged with, with Harambe and with the, with, with the songs and with the chants. And so I, I hope that we can use Freedom Schools to break the tie that people assume that once a kid goes off to juvenile detention, they're going to go off to adult prison. One of my stars, and go to our website and look at one of the, the examples of a young Latino man who um, said he can't promise anything, but he's sure going to work on his younger siblings. And he's went back, we're trying to send, he went back to a community college. Um, and so we've got to be careful about how we send kids back into the same neighborhoods with the same influences. And so we really need to form more relationships with community colleges. But the point is, children will live up or down to your expectations. And when they see love and they see that they have somebody who believes in them and they, many of them leave, leave such difficult lives, um, they will rise to the occasion. And so I just hope we can get freedom schools everywhere. Um, for all ages, and that we can infuse this freedom school pedagogy and energy and, um, into our public schools and make it fun. And a number of public schools are running them, and I'm grateful a number of colleges are using them, and main HCB, historically black colleges and universities are putting them on, because I want black kids and brown kids to see that there's something called college and not just prison in their future. And it's a pipeline, and I want to, for new teachers who are going to go into public education that had not planned. And so freedom schools are win-wins. We need to move them to scale, we need to sustain them, and we're now trying to figure out how we can make more of them year-round and after-school programs, because I hate saying after six weeks of having a lot of fun, bye, see you next year. Um, children let down so much, so I hope that this can become something that communities can adopt, because again, they need to be engaged with caring adults all the time. Thank you for your work. <laughs> Yes. Hi, thank you for speaking about the supports that are needed for kinship families. I was wondering what other changes in child welfare and foster care policies would have an impact on child and young adult poverty. Oh, Mary Lee, where are you? You've got the expert. I'm going to refer you to Mary Lee Allen. Where are you, Mary Lee? All right, now this is the expert. I think certainly the wonderful support from kinship caregivers and ensuring that they get the support they need is key. But at the Children's Defense Fund for many years, we've really focused on how can we keep children safely with their families at the front end of the system and prevent them from going into foster care along the way. The other big piece is how can we ensure that once in care, children get the help they need so that they can safely move, if not back home, into other permanent families, kinship or with adoptive families. But one more piece, we also have to ensure that those families who are caring for children coming out of the foster care system also get the support they need so that they don't bounce back in and bounce back out. And I think there's some good things happening in states and communities around the country, and now we've got to get the federal government to align the dollars with the good outcomes for children. So there's a lot to do and we look forward to working with you all to make it happen. Uh, 
Uh, thank you, and thank you for your extreme common sense approach. I have one question to you. You said this would take $77 million? $77 billion. $77.2 okay. billion. billion. Okay, billion. billion. I misunderstood. Because, I mean, I thought that was much too little money, so it's billion. $77.2 so, two billion, billion, but it will save $500 billion in a dollars. year in, isn't for, it in dropouts and foregone isn't productivity. Isn't it possible to get, I mean, like the, the, the Gates Foundation Fund to give, I mean, to this extremely... Um, common sense approach to our future. We're going to try. Anybody who wants to give, we think that this makes a lot of sense. Don't know. We're always hand to mouth. But it's, no, no, no. I, I, we've got to go out and make the case. I really hope you will go to the website and read this report and really go out and talk about it in your churches and community groups and your networks. And let's build a groundswell. We cannot afford not, quite apart from the human cost and the moral cost. Um, to continue all the school dropouts, the incarceration costs, um, the dependency costs, um, the, the remediation costs from poor health and all the other things that come from, from, from child poverty. And so I don't know why it's so hard to get our country to do what is right for children, to do what we know would work, and to do what will save sense. And that gets to the issue of power. And so power has got to be us. It's got to be our voice. It's got to be our vote. And let me, I, I forgot one of my, my, I forgot my favorite Noah's Ark lesson as I was so busy trying to get, stay within my time limit and I wasn't looking. But the last um, lesson that is my favorite is that remember that the Ark, that the Ark was built by amateurs and that the Titanic was built by experts. <laughs> And so many of us really are looking for experts, for Congress, for the policymakers and others to come in and save our children. It's going to be ordinary people who are going to be pulling together in multiple millions of voices for our children. So Dr. King's not coming back. We're going to have to be it. And all of us are going to have to raise our voices now. I'll just tell you, of all the people in this room, made themselves absolute pest um, on your school board and your city council, on your state legislature, you're going to move Ohio along, but your voice is what is needed. So thank you again. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we have been enjoying a Friday forum featuring Marion Wright Edelman, president and founder of the Children's Defense Fund. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This forum is now adjourned.